Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Not To Comic Book. This being a show where we talk about TV shows that are adaptations of comic books. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about Secret Invasion, Season 1, Episode 2. A lot of really interesting things went down in this episode, so let's break it down. So we're picking up in the aftermath of the last episode. Well, actually, we start off with a recap, kind of taking place. Now, what we did, we started off with a recap, but then we also got the two years after the events of Captain Marvel. They, uh, the scrolls are back on Earth because... Because their war with the Creed did not go that way and some had to escape. And it's interesting, you know, tying this together with the whole um, Nick and uh, Talos conversation about the amount of uh, scrolls that are on this planet. He thought like, oh, there's only like the few that he's aware of. It's like, no, there's actually like a million here. He's like, when it all went down, like when the million scattered, the million that ran away from the war that went to survive were scattered around, he called them out. I mean, he even says like, right, there's some of us still scattered out there in the universe, obviously being hunted down. So a lot of all those millions. So there, that, there are scrolls that are here that even Fury isn't aware of. I guess that small group we saw at the beginning is like maybe the small faction that he knew of. Well, I mean, he knows there's a good chunk of them because he knows there's the people Gravit Scott and then he's got like the ones that he's aware of too. So even then, it's probably like maybe there was like a hundred, maybe a couple hundred that he was aware of that were here on Earth. But now it's like, no, there's mil there's like a million here. And it's been, oh, blah. Well, no, because he made it sound, I mean, because we actually don't know when, I was about to say, because we don't know when um, Talos might have sent out that signal. He kind of made it sound like, hey, it might have been around the time everyone was dusted in that five-year period, because that's the perfect time for some people to just kind of like, you know, to hijack some people's lives and stuff like that. So that might have been a perfect time to kind of reach out, or maybe it was sometime between, like, not unless it was somewhere between 97 and uh, 2018, that 21 years and stuff. Like, who knows? But, I mean, it, it matters because it wonders, makes you wonder how long have they been on Earth? So, a couple decades versus a couple years still matters. But when you have shapeshifters, it kind of won't matter as much, which is going to be interesting. But, because <clears throat> it also explains how... Fury has always been so on top of things. It isn't just because he's really good at his job. He's had a massive network working with him because it's like, hey, you help me protect this Earth because I because of the events of Captain Marvel, I know that there's a larger scale threat out there and I need your help protecting this planet while me and Carol will go find you a new home. And over two decades later, that didn't happen. I mean, we might even be pushing on three decades at this point. I'm like, we're close enough to it depending on what time frame? We don't know what year it is currently because we know at least what an end game was like. Post time skip of end game was like 2023, and it's probably been even longer since it. So it's probably like anywhere between 2025 and 2027 already in the MCU. So it might already be pushing that 30 year period already, if not like a year or two short, a year or two shy, maybe. So, but he made that promise. That it's like, right, I need you to believe in me. And so many people did. They put on these faces. They became these people to help Fury. And that's why I think he's been able to always stay three steps ahead. Is because he had a scroll network of people working with him to help protect this planet. He didn't protect this planet on his own. He had others in place to kind of help with that. So understandable why they would kind of be pissed. It's like, once again, it's like nearly three decades of us not having a home. Plus, we did all this for you because of your promises and Gravitz who believed in Fury probably even thought of Fury almost like a father especially as we know he managed to escape the war on its own uh, on like a ship but that was like after his parents had died so he was already very gifted at a young age and he was probably like young and angry after what he had lost but he thought he found something in Fury and he was inspired by Fury and I think that's what really irks his nerve where it's like right you abandoned us we did all of this we did everything for you and what have you done for us you know that's that's then we've protected your home for what for you not to find us one so fine this this world is here for the taking we'll be the ones to take it because i think it's also going to be a thing of us having already lost our world we're going to appreciate this world more than the humans who've been living here for so long they don't appreciate it so but we will i think that's probably like the um 
potential thought process that Gravitz has, you know. But once again, he's just, he's young and angry, and he's lashing out against, like I said, I think a, the pseudo-father figure in his life, so. Because I love that setup, too, of, like, um, Telos and uh, Fury's conversation. Because it started with him being like, oh, yeah, I used to take these train rides with my mom, and we had this whole game of what do I not know? And he's like, right, uh, I straight up lied to my mom, and she kind of accepted it about the whole, like, what was it, him and Susie was that? Was that He's like, oh, we were playing doctor, but I couldn't tell my mom that. And so um, it's like, right, but even though like I was lying, that lie in itself told my mom all she needed to know about the circumstances. So he asked Talos, what do I know? It's like, no, the game is, what do I not know? And he didn't know that there were millions of scrolls here, but it's like, right, I had to do what I had to do for my people. What would you have done? And he's like, no, 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 this ain't about me. I'm the one who dictated the terms, so you don't get to turn it on me. But it's like, yeah, but once again, you weren't here for us. Like, you were gone for five years. I didn't, so also implies that Talos, Talos and them, maybe probably his entire family were here during the blitz the way the fact is he said that so it makes you wonder how many of the scrolls were affected by the blood we don't know yet but it's i, I didn't think you were coming back so i did what i needed to do to ensure the safety of my people because i couldn't count on your trust and friendship and leadership and during this circumstance so and then it's like when you did return it wasn't that long before you immediately were like, oh, I got to go to my space station to Earth on top of it. Yeah. Oh, all this pain I went through. Oh, the burden of being here was too heavy. I get it. Uh, the blip was rough for everyone, but I can understand why for Fury it was even heavier because he had put in so many contingency plans. Once again, this is a situation where Fury has always managed to stay a step or two ahead. And like I said, it's because he had an entire network of alien species secretly here on Earth helping make that a possibility. But all those contingencies, everything he set up, having the Avengers wasn't enough for half the planet to get... Once again, it makes you realize how minuscule you are when someone like a Thanos can come about because you can't prepare for a Thanos. You cannot prepare for the Infinity Stones. You can't be prepared for something where, like, half the universe is gone with a snap of a finger. Like, you can't prepare for that, and I think it's just enough to give you, you know, PTSD where it's just like, I failed this planet, you know? And it's like, where it's my job to always be ahead, I didn't see this coming. And also, like, right, it probably cuts even deeper when it's like, Tony's dead. Tony had to be the one, the one that helped jumpstart this project. It's starting with him that he's gone, like, and and also Natasha's gone, so, like, all the foundation of what you had built started crumbling. It exists in its legacies, but you were so caught up in your own pain, you're refusing to really see all that's kind of, all the pieces to this puzzle that are there. Because, I mean, and I think it fits, narratively speaking, too, with what the Avengers are right now. There are no Avengers. Everyone is scattered all across, doing their own thing, their own circumstances, and obviously all of this Whatever the story ultimately ends up being, the thing that ultimately culminates, whether it is going to still be Kang or what it's going to be, is going to culminate in all of the Avengers finally coming back together again. But they're all on their separate Avengers. They're all disjointed after everything. Like, there's no Fury to kind of rail, ring them back in. And maybe that is going to be Fury's future post this show. It's going to be reining all the Avengers back in for, like, you know, the fight that's coming, you know? And because I love that line where he told a roadie where it's like, hey, when I'm dead, even when I'm out, I'm I'm still in. But that's him puffing his chest because it's like, right, I'm not the Sprite Chicken I you once was, and I just, I can't shake it. I didn't, I meant to bring this up last episode. I think it's an interesting parallel to how, it's almost an interesting inverse of Tony's circumstances when you think about it. Because what did Tony do? Like, Tony joined the Avengers and... Then he had, like, the, the Shatari situation when he was in space. It gave him PTSD in Iron Man 2 and eventually led to, um... No, 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 in Iron Man 3, sorry. Um, in Iron Man 3 and... He wanted to create that whole thing. His response, like Fury had his own network. What did, uh, um, Tony want to do? Create an arm, uh armor for the entire planet obviously that did not go well so it like i said that's why i feel like it's the inverse because we see fury had already set up his his a suit of armor for the planet already he set up a foundation and now he's getting into ptsd after the fact because his armor around the world didn't necessarily work so i just think there's interesting parallels but also flips on the tony and parallel between him and tony like there's a, there's parallels and then there's juxtapositions to 
uh, their circumstances. And, you know, maybe I'm just reading too much into that, but I feel like there is a thread that you can kind of pull on that front. Um, Fury also uh, met uh, with Maria's mom, and it's like, right, so my daughter is dead. The reason why I have to bury my daughter is because of you. She believed in you so much, and she died for you, so do not let that go to waste. Make sure, like, whatever this is you got her involved in, whatever it is, whatever fight you're fighting, make sure it was worth it in the end, so... Because now, because of everything that went down in Moscow, now the U.S. is getting blamed. And obviously, that's the whole point of, like, expediting things and kind of getting all these countries turned against each other as part of Gravit's move. So he's getting, um, making the U.S. take blame for all of this because it's like, oh, uh, whatever that group was, one of the groups that the, um, Scrolls are setting up to be like the main ones to kind of point everything towards the U.S. Because the guy's screaming, he's like making sure to be, like, hey, I'm an American, I'm an American. It's like, right, that was on purpose. And you know, the U.S. Uh, isn't that Chris McDonald? Isn't that that actor's name? Uh, being like, oh, like this can't be like he's a news reporter or whatever. Being like, right, there's no way the government, uh, the U.S. had anything to do with this. Now we kind of understand more. It really sets this tone of what, not tone, but gives us a back, like, um, finally gives us perspective on the Skrull's involvement in the world's movement. That there's literally a cabal that's kind of dictated and kind of helped shape the way the world's kind of moved since they've landed on this planet. Because we found out that the little group that, um, uh, of l l powerful people, like typical kind of leaders. One is like the leader of NATO. The other one's like, uh, I think the UK prime minister, I believe. And it turns out that they are all scrolls, part of the council that Talos got kicked off of. I wonder, was he still in some leader posi leadership position or was he still kind of behind the scenes at that time? Uh, but... They're the ones that kind of dictated, kind of kept things as peaceful as possible on Earth. Like, they've always probably uh, been the ones that kind of navigate things. So it's like been this secret cabal of squirrels that have been kind of dictating the world's future in, in, in some capacity, at least keeping things in line. But here's Gravitz, and now part of that. Maybe he always what? Well, no, because, yeah, he, he, he took Talos' position on it. So after he got kicked out, I believe. And he's the one kind of leading this charge of war because he's talking about what humans are. You know, because you have Talos wanting to believe like, oh, like I can, I believe we can find a balance between humans and, and scrolls. But Nick is like, are you crazy, Talos? Like, look at what humans do. We can't even get along with each other. And that's been a long history in humankind of like us going at toe and toe with each other. You really think they're really going to be accepting another species on this planet? You know, it's like that that's a heavy conversation of like, yeah, like we're at each other's throats for being from different countries and speaking the different languages, like some, not everyone, but some people. And it's like the resources on this planet. You really think we're going to really be happy having like a million of another species here in that same capacity is like, that's a big no. So and it, but, but that's also like grab like kind of in the same wheelhouse of what Gravik's point is, because it's like, oh, like they're saying like, oh, you're not you're more like a dog. And he's like, oh, I'd rather be a dog because they don't cage each other up. And, like, uh, basically sell each other, to, basically into prostitution. And they don't poison and kill each other the way humans do. And degrade their own planet the way they do. So, just every, you know, it's like, right, it is, this is the history of humans. It has continued to be the history of humans, despite everything. And it's kind of like, they don't deserve this planet. We will, we will be the ones to take it from them then. And all of the others kind of fall in line. Well, the U the one pretend the one that's the UK uh, prime minister, she was already on um, graphic side, but the others fall in line because it's like right, we were lied to about what we what we were supposed to get our home. It's like well, we're, there's a perfectly good one here that we're primed for the taking. But one of them, she refused to kind of bow down because she's like right. The reason why uh, we lost our home in the first place wasn't because we weren't quick enough to go to war. It's because we were too quick and too ready to go to war. And she's like, I will never support you. I will never submit. He's like, well, don't worry, sister. You will be able to leave. I was like, is he really? Because I was thinking Gaia might pop her. But I mean, she was only told like, hey, if I don't come out of this room, 
kill the guy in front of you, but not like anyone that left the room. So she got the leave, but she ended up hitting up Talos because it's like, right, that's the only other light minded person. Everyone else, a part of that council fell in line. And now he's the general. He's going to lead them during this war, you know, so. And because when he came back, uh, back to their home, like everyone was celebrating him. Like they're all sucked up into this, this cult mindset. So, you know, there's no changing their minds. It's, it seems, it's interesting with Gaia, cause I wasn't, I, I went back and forth last episode. And it even feels like I still went back and forth a good chunk of this episode of what her motives are. But it seems like she is working with someone else. I don't know if it's necessarily Fury or Talos or what. But she's working with someone else because she gave that phone call later on in the episode and then all of a sudden their base was compromised. And it's like, oh, how did they find us? And it's like, oh, they think it's the guy that was captured and tortured gave them up. But it's like, no, he didn't give anything up about your hideout. So it definitely had to be her. So is she doing this for her dad or has she always been deep cover? Like who, like that's, I, I don't know her motive. Has she worked her way up, has been undercover this entire time working her way up or has she, has she always sipped the Kool-Aid or was that just her pretending to sip the Kool-Aid? You were still responsible and for helping kill 2000 people, over 2000 people, um, in the events of last episode. So is this kind of a necessary sacrifice for this war? Or is it that she is so flip floppy right now because she doesn't know what to believe? I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's understandable considering like no one knows what to believe in this show because it's like whose allegiances are to who and what, you know? Because she did do some examination because it turns out they're harvesting something and at first it's unclear what, but it's related to some kind of weapon that they're building. And she looked into it like the doctors, one of them is, was it Rosa Dalton? And she looks into it and finds out they're taking DNA strains from other species because we saw one was Groot, one was like a frost beast and stuff. So I'm like... And then later on, when uh, Sonya's doing the interrogation, it's like, what are they making? And it's like, something to make us stronger. It's like, oh, so I was like, is this where the super scroll is going to come into play? Like, are you going to try and amplify not just one scroll? I wonder if Gravik's going to end up becoming the super scroll in this universe. If they, It feels like they're going down that route. Um, but it's like, I guess, like, I mean, and because the super scroll is usually associated with the fantastic four because it's like hey i took all the fantastic force powers and i'm the super scroll like it's thing is like it can absorb all abilities it's a little rogue ish if i'm understanding once again i know very little about the super scroll i've seen it what it looks like in the comics and stuff but i don't know if it's what its history is and stuff like that. So since the Fantastic Four don't exist yet, maybe you can get some version of the Super Scroll with like powers like Groot and so on and so forth. Like maybe that's what that's kind of implying with like the that's what they're harvesting, trying to harvest like specific DNAs. I mean, maybe trying to harvest DNA strands from everything in this universe. Maybe I don't know. Very specific powers and abilities they're going after. I don't know. I wonder will they make it like a, will it just be one single scroll, maybe at the end of it all, but maybe they initially try to make multiple super scrolls and it only comes out to one successful one and that is the super scroll? We'll have to wait and see. Um, but obviously, uh, because we now know the scrolls are like pitting all the countries against each other, like when uh, Rhodey has to stand before them and answers, but he's like, no, that you don't have any hard evidence that it's like, yes, if, if, uh, Nick Fury was in Moscow. He was could have been there. Him and Maria could have been there as citizens. That doesn't mean they were in, there in any official capacity. And it's like, right. Uh, we'd also like, to, if you want to confirm it, we can confirm it by checking out that photo. I mean, we can't guarantee it because it's Russian photo. So we, we, we can't really 100% trust that. So I was like, Rhodey's kind of very different. I don't think we've, we haven't had too many opportunities to see Rhodey in his job, I think it's one thing. Like, we've seen moments in, like, Iron Man 2 and stuff, and maybe in Iron Man 3, but I don't think we've ever... Uh, we haven't consistently seen Rhodey in his positions, especially as he's risen up the ranks over the years. But just even that moment where, like, Slovakia was kind of rolling his, eye, his her eyes, and, it, like, the, the leader of Slovakia was rolling her eyes, and he's like, if Slovakia rolls her eyes one more time, I'm a carpet bot. I'm going to put on the suit, and I'm a carpet bot. I was like, Jesus, Rhodey. And then later on, it's like, oh, who's giving you trouble, Rhodes? Uh, Croatia, he's like, no, Slovakia. 
carpet bomb on them. I'm like, why the hell is that both of your solutions? The fact is you can even joke about that. It's twisted, but there's like two fold to it. One, it's like, well, you know, being a little gun ho about bombing a country. It's like, mm, you know, sounds very U.S. of us, you know, but also it's also like maybe maybe the sad thing is there might be high official people in that world who do joke about shit like that. You're, you just never know. So, but, uh, Rody's saying, like, right, the president isn't here uh, because he's a busy person and he doesn't, like, yes, I feel, what was it that he says, we understand what you're going through and we want to help, but we're not going to placate you guys. We're not going to bend to your will because I, the president, who is the leader of the most powerful country in the world, like, kind of having, like, Rody having to flex on him like that. So, him meeting with uh, Nick, and I'd heard previously from someone, like, because obviously, like, um, there are uh, reviewers and stuff who had gotten the first two episodes. So some people were really excited about because uh, I'd heard people talk about the conversation between Rhodey and um, Nick that they really, really liked. And I really, really liked it, too. It's like it is such an I was that conversation did not go the route I thought it was going to go because it's like, OK, first and foremost, turns out Rhodey's known about scrolls for 15 years, which I was like, wait, wouldn't that put that as like around Iron Man, Iron Man 2, maybe? I mean, if it's if it's even that, because it might be, it may even post Iron Man 3 pre-Avengers, maybe, he would have found out about it. Because like I said, it just depends on what exact, what year is it exactly. Like I said, it had to be like 2025 or like 2027, so if that's the case... Yeah, to put it maybe around Iron Man 2 pre Avengers, like everything else, like uh winter uh parts of Captain America, um the first Avenger and uh Thor. I'd kinda put it around those time frames if, if and that how much how long he's known about the scrolls. Cause they they it, I mean once again being a high ranking official, it's like uh, in the military he was confirmed about that but even he doesn't know the full scale of it he's like right i knew that was something we had to be worried about an invasion or whatever it's like well the invasion's already here kind of technically happened a while back but now it's just escalated into a full-blown invasion i mean i guess arguably because there was like a million scrolls here that even fury didn't know about uh kind of proves like the invasion kind of happened a long time ago oh or at least a while ago like i said depending on when talos actually contacted the others out there to come to earth so it's like, oh, should we evolve, involve our friends? But Nick's like, no, because if we do that, the last thing we want is them shape shifting into our friends and making them into terrorists. It's like, yeah, the last thing. I mean, especially because, like, well, the Avengers still also have the whole, you know, Sokovia thing on as a, a black mark against them. You know, let's let's not forget about that. It's like, if it wasn't for the whole Ultron Sokovia situation, you would have never given given birth to a uh, a Zemo. So. So I think stuff like that, but it's like, yeah, last time we want them to do is be labeled as terrorists. So I'm going to be the one to handle this, which Rhodey's like, of course, you're going to be the one that thinks you can handle this. And it's kind of like, right, I'm in my position as I am to try and help save this world uh, by I'm able to help save this world. Not not just by doing my superhero thing, but doing my due diligence and keeping my position because the U.S.'s positions is at the very plays a major role in a lot of the world power. So his role is just Rhodey outside of just being War Machine plays such a significant role, which people did. There was talk that this does lead directly into Armor Wars, which we still haven't heard anything about. There still haven't been really any updates. To be fair, it's currently a writer's strike, so it makes sense. I think the last update we got was, obviously, it's moving away from being a TV show and being into a full-length movie. I think that's the last update we really got about it, maybe. Um, so I could see that kind of feeding into it where Rhodey's kind of torn probably between, like, between those two elements of himself of, like, yes, I'm War Machine, which kind of ties into my governmental job, but maybe that kind of ends up having, he has to kind of counter what he has to do as Rhodey um, as like, you know, maybe those two sides of himself kind of have to come into conflict. Maybe, maybe that could be part of the story. I don't know, but it's like, right. You kind of owe me Rhodey for putting you in your position. It's like, Oh, I owe you. It's like, we owe each other because we made sure that what was the exact words? Uh, those who are God, the exact wording they wording they used was 
basically people who don't like who aren't good enough for the job get it and when you know we had to fight because some people inherited the job just because of their family name and the fact we well, got the positions because of family names people like us blood sweat and tear worked into us getting to where we are and you know it's like we kind of have to look after each other brother which i love Rody turning that back on him of like yes we made sure that no one that's mediocre got these jobs but we're it's also in our due diligence it's our due diligence to make sure that no one mediocre that doesn't look like us gets this situation but it's also on us to make sure that no one mediocre who looks like us keeps that position and kind of turned it on fury being like you are not the man you were you are you are mediocre at what you do now and it's just like yo i i love that uh, I, I think it's a very poignant conversation of like, right, like we're making sure that people who are mediocre that, you know, like we're here to look after like, you know, what's best for everyone, but also have our own because other people won't have our best interests. But just because we're all black doesn't mean we all kind of have to ride together. We got to make sure that people who don't deserve it don't get that position either because they can tarnish everything. So we fight tooth and nail to get here, but only because we do deserve it. And we got to make sure that even people who look like us, who are connecting us on a personal and professional and ancestral history, we can't let that get in the way of people being the best for their job. And if you aren't black or not, if you're not good for the job, get the hell out of the way type of situation. So I thought that was kind of kind of a wild conversation for them to end up having. So I thought that was pretty interesting. So. And like I brought up earlier, you have Nick trying to like puff out his chest and, you know, create this bravado to show like, no, 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 I still got it. I still got it in control, but it's like, no, nah, like, like him kind of trying to catch his breath afterwards, literally getting fired because Rhodey was like, no, they didn't uh, send me here to do it. I offered to be the one to do it. So now Fury's kind of out in the cold. So especially at a time where he has no allies, like, well, he kind of threw Talos to the wind because of their beef right now. Maria's gone, so who can he really turn to? He's keeping the Avengers at bay. Uh, so it's like, who who can you turn to in this moment? Then, I mean, I guess one of the people who ended up turning to is Sonya, who ended up getting some information, which I'm like, I love Olivia Coleman, just like how cheeky she can be. And it's just like, hey, that, that guy's like, hey, the door's like, oh, it's not locked anymore. And you know what that says about me and everything, you know, you know what that actually means. So she went to the back room where they're torturing. And I love, she's like, didn't your mother tell you you could go blind by beating your meat like that? I was like, gee, really? We're going there? So... She ends up kind of stepping and taking over the interrogation. Uh, goes over. It's like, all right, so we're going to do this the easy way, the hard way. Oh, you're going to play it like that. Snips off the guy's finger. It shifts back. And she's like, okay, so that answers that. So, and she's going to, thre she's threatening to inject him with this stuff that's going to basically burn his, make his blood feel like it's burning. Because I like, go ahead and inject into my arm. She's like, okay. And she was so cheeky and literally injected in one of his cheeks, uh, butt cheeks. And so I was like, man, he looked like he was in pain. And I was like, yikes. And just her being like, so just, the, the energy she can bring to this role, like how cheeky and how fun she is, but also it's it's that juxtaposition of how she carries herself in those scenes. Because um, it's like how diabolical she can be sometimes. I mean, I think, you know, when you look at some of the roles she's taken on in the past, like how diabolical she can be. I want to say the first thing I ever saw her in was, wasn't it? I want to say uh, Fleabag, where she was... Fleabag's stepmom, if I remember correctly. It's been a while. But if I remember, wasn't she like her evil stepmom? I think that was a, my first introduction to Olivia Coleman, which I think is kind of a neat juxtaposition to who she really is. Like when you see her in interviews, she has she's so fun and has such a bubbly personality. And you're like, I want to give you a hug because she's just that type of person. And you, you compare that to the role she takes on where you're just like, oh, I don't like you. And, you know, uh, but it's like there's something like sinister yet fun about Sonya as a character and it's like okay cool got the information I needed out of you and oh looks like your rescue team is here knocks him off off the chair so that she could get into the escape hatch it's like oh look at this this is fun and ended up escaping and I love home dude was like yo um Gravix, I promise you, I didn't tell them anything. I just lied to them. It's like, yeah, self-preservation kicked in, but sadly, uh, your uh, hiding spot got exposed. So he thought you did tell Sonya things, but not exactly, not exactly the stuff that you got killed for. He had his reservations, I'm sure, but their uh, hideout being exposed just kind of solidified it for him. I'm like, okay, it definitely had to be you. 
which obviously it's got to be tough for um it's got to be tough for Gaia, considering it's like, well, I'm the reason why he died, but that's that spy stuff. You got to preserve your, um, you got to preserve your, uh, cover and everything. Which home dude with her was there knowing like, oh, uh, if graphics ever ask about it, it's like, well, she was there. Oh, she took a step out to go check on you guys. And graphics be like, wait, what? Uh, so that's the problem. Well, because she did ask him to ask, say, like, oh, he's ready. He's soon ready for a permanent phase. So I guess that was kind of his trial run or whatever that he went along with them. I was like, that felt like that was Gravis doing that on purpose. So maybe he's secretly there to keep an eye on Gaia. Because he had brought it up previously when he was talking to Gaia. He was like, right, your dad didn't have, couldn't, didn't have what it takes. And so when he sent his daughter, I thought like, oh, this is a coward who still doesn't have what it takes. Because I guess he thought like Gaia was here to take care of him. but Because Gaia still hasn't pressed him or anyone else about them being responsible for, his mom's, for her mom's death. So, I don't know. It, uh, I, I'm so curious to see how where all that kind of takes us. And then finally we get our stinger at the end when it turns out, hey, Nick is married and his wife is a scroll. So at the very least, I don't know if that's a more recent, recent thing or it's been a while because obviously scrolls have been here for like, I wonder, is that supposed to be the lady that introduced him to grab it all those, uh, all those years ago? It feels like that might be her, but um, I feel like it's super poetic that he actually has a wife. I mean, I doubt he has kids. I mean, for all we know, maybe. But at the very, maybe he never really had kids because some of his other agents, like maybe a Maria Hill or even a um, Natasha and Clint, maybe he thought of them almost like kids. Even thought of Gravitz like a kid, like I brought up. Like I, I think there, there is kind of like a complicated father son relationship and dynamic there. So when it's all said and done, though. I think it's very poetic for him to secretly have a... I mean, as we found out with other people, we found out, you know, we first got introduced to Clint's secret family in Age of Ultron, which obviously we've learned subsequently in Hawkeye that his wife was a um, agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. Was it... I always forget. Is it Mockingbird or Mockingjay? I want to say it's Mockingjay. Is was Linda Cardellini's character's, like, former... Obviously, there was a different version of the character in... Um, I think it's, she's agent... In, wasn't her agent name number 13? Isn't her... Because obviously she's in, I know her from the character from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., but like it's a different version in the MCU's continuity. Uh, but yeah, like I guess maybe, but I, part of me was wondering, is that why Clint did that? Because maybe Fury inspired him to do that. It's like they probably learned a lot from Fury, so he's probably the one that told him, like, hey, if you're going to have this life, you're going to have to do this. So maybe Clint wasn't the one that came up with that. And, I mean, maybe because Clint and his wife worked with. Nick, that maybe that led to them unknowing and deciding to do something like that, because maybe Nick told them he did the same thing. Obviously, Natasha's family circumstances are different, but yeah, she, you know, had a secret family kind of pop up out of the woodwork, so it's, I don't know, I just thought that was, I mean, it's very befitting of, like, the spyhood of just trying to keep your family as far off the radar as possible, so they never get used against you, especially when you're in the spy craft and spy world, um, everyone's looking to take advantage of someone else, and you never want the people you care about most to be used against you in that capacity. So maybe we'll learn more about those circumstances and situations next episode. Um, I'm very excited to ultimately see where all of this ends up taking us going forward. Uh, but really, that's all I wanted to talk about. Until the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, love light to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day and good night.